right, my darlings? Well, time for our annual obligated Doctor Who review, and, like normal, we're looking at something that is a bit outside the police box for the franchise. Are we finally looking at that porn parody, then? Which one? There's tons of them. There is? Well, I know what I'm doing after this video's over. Lovely. No, in fact, we're looking at the three attempts to bring Doctor Who into the animation world, with the three Doctor Who animated specials. Now, we have looked at the proposed cartoon series that was going to be made in the 90s, but never happened with Blue, but this time, we're looking at the three ones that were made, Scream of the Shalka, The Infinite Quest, and Dreamland. After what I'm doing tonight, it's going to be more like wet Dreamland. Stop it! That's enough of that. Honestly. You get a few high view comic dubs and all of a sudden he thinks he can get away with anything. I can and you know it. Whatever. But let's get into the backstory. Doctor Who has always ventured into other battlegrounds to expand its franchise, the most famous of course being the beloved Doctor Who Big Finish audio dramas, which started in the 90s. But there's also novels, comic books, behind the scenes sideshows, spin-off shows and of course toys. And since Doctor Who is arguably the biggest franchise the UK has spawned, possibly only second behind James Bond and Harry Potter, naturally they eventually decided to venture into animation. The first special was Scream of the Shulker, which came about during what was known as the Wilderness Years of Doctor Who. I've talked about the Wilderness Years before, but basically to sum up for newbies, it's the period of time between 1989 and 2005, when there was no regular Doctor Who series anymore. The original series had just been cancelled and the revival series had not been made yet, so there was nothing official on TV for the Whovians, but we still had plenty of unofficial and unsuccessful attempts to revive the series. I've talked about the BBV productions before, which are probably the biggest attempts of the Wilderness Years, but just before the revival series came out, there was a multi-part animation web series which took place in a separate continuity to the previous series featuring a new Doctor, new enemies and companions. I couldn't find any information if this was a little experiment for the BBC or if it was a genuine attempt to revive the franchise for a new generation, but either way, now it's just regarded as a weird little did you know thing of the franchise. Much like class. We do not speak of that abomination. This special was released over the course of November and December of 2003 in conjunction with the franchise's 40th anniversary on the early form of BBC I, which had previously seen success with the animated special Ghosts of Albion, and was actually the first motion production of Doctor Who Russell T Davis ever worked on. Though, thankfully, this Doctor didn't go on a massive moral rant and pretend to be Jesus. The one trope of RTD's writing did make it in, but we'll get to that later. The special was animated by our old friends at Cosgrove Hall, though sadly, no David Jason in this one. I'd have loved to have seen David play some sort of weird, gross-looking creature with petrified flesh hanging from his deformed body. So, basically how he looks now? You do not mock the voice of Ducula! Since RTD wrote this special, naturally it's a lot more modern than the classic series, since the characters featured having a much more working class feel to them, as opposed to the slightly more posh feel of the characters in the previous series were. It has a bit of a gritty tone to it, and... Of course, the Doctor is a smug jackass who we can't help but love anyway. Always leave it to a gay writer to make a dickhead that you love. The Doctor here is played by Richard E. Grant, returning from Stephen Moffat's first Doctor Who outing, The Curse of Fatal Death, though obviously not as the same character. This Doctor, while having a very high and mighty attitude and a very flowery delivery, does have a few of the elements that would go into the real Ninth Doctor, Christopher Eccleston. He's a fast talker, is very high on himself and likes to insult people, and does work quite well. Grant has a knack for playing characters that would be annoying, but he can make them fun. He's not as good as the real Ninth Doctor, but I still quite like him a lot. His design is okay, it feels like they're trying to do an update on the Doctor's very theatrical dress sense from the previous series, but have it be more dark and gritty at the same time, and it does come off as very generic. Say what you will about Eccleston and Tennant's simple wardrobe, it did leave an impression on you. This just doesn't really stick with you as much, but it's still an okay look. Anyways, enough of the details, let's look at the plot. We first meet this Doctor going into a pub, whose beer mats have a very similar design to them. Sad truth is, after Cosgrove went under, most of its staff probably did end up working in a pub, or lying pissed outside of one. On the subject of the animation company, let's talk about the animation. You can clearly see that it's done with flash animation, and while I give Cosgrove Hall some credit in trying something new, yeah, this hasn't aged very well. It's not bad flash animation at all, and I do like the art style. It's very dynamic and stylized, but it looks very awkward and the movement is very jerky and stiff. 
Like I said, it's still well done on a technical level, but it's nothing too impressive now. Yeah, compared to the animation you can do, right? Hey, I never claim to be a great animator, okay? Or a great YouTuber. Don't make me get the bugle and the foxhounds. He has a chat with a barmaid called Chaney. Any relation to Lon? Wonderful chap. Hairy hands. Who's voiced by Sophie Okanado, who would go on to play Liz 10 in Series 5. This scene doesn't have much going for it other than introducing us to the Doctor and Cheney, but it's slowly revealed that an alien creature, known as the Schalke, seems to have taken up residence in the town underground, and have left this place a place where people are scared to go outside or do anything in fear of making the Schalke angry. So, it's actually kind of similar to the plot of The World's End, and I will say, it does really give the special a sense of atmosphere. There's very little music, and given that all the dialogue is spoken very softly, it gives it an almost silent hill feel to it. I really like it. They also tease how there seems to be a sort of rash of throat complaints going around, but they can't figure out where it's coming from. It is weird just how much of the people of this town have accepted this situation now. I mean, a world where we can't go outside and unseen forces threatening to kill people and making them have sore throats. Wait, that sounds familiar. Like something happened recently that was like that. You're not wrong. And... Well, I think we can say without certainty that people were much more vocal about what happened back then. The Doctor visits Cheney and Joe, her boyfriend, where we finally get a proper look at the Schalke, who are pretty cool looking. Admittedly, the dark tones on the colour scheme make it hard to tell where parts of them end and begin, but it is a cool design. The suckers on their back also remind me a lot of the Zygons. Though, hopefully, these ones won't end up having pointless sex scenes like a previous Wilderness Years production we watched did. The three manage to escape the Schalke, and Grant gets a chance to show off his version of the Doctor with a typical come-up-with-a-plan-on-the-fly moment. You're not human. Decent of you to say. What are you? Mildly annoyed. Now you know how Paul McGann felt acting alongside you. But, with a lot of improv and dialogue, he manages to blow up some of the Schalke in a classic Doctor Who fashion. But the Schalke steal the TARDIS, and thus the Doctor decides to call in the big guns to sort them out. Meanwhile, in the TARDIS, we're introduced to one of the most confusing parts of this special, its version of the Master. So, this Master is voiced by Derek Jacobi, which the fact that he is the Master alone is enough to make me happy. My dear sir, and or madam, say something. Do I take it you wish to board the TARDIS by force? But he seems to be the companion of the Doctor this time, and very willingly too. This is weird in and of itself, since the Master is the Doctor's sworn enemy, but I could see them forming an uneasy alliance and helping the Doctor out. I mean, they do end up doing that in the modern series at one point. And they have implied that he and the Doctor have some friendly history together, but it's made all the more confusing by how, and I am jumping the gun here, but I have to address this. This version of the Master is a robot. Well, I am afraid that I won't let... And then it's given another layer of confusion when it's further revealed that he and the Doctor seem to be in some kind of relationship. <laughs> Leave a message after the beep and we'll try and get back to you before you call. Stop that! We really should change that message. So, the Doctor built a robotic version of his worst enemy to be a fuck buddy. This just raises so many questions, so many of which I don't think I want to know the answer to. Oh come on, we've all made robotic versions of people we don't like. Why do you think you've never truly gotten rid of me? Oh come on, that's just system error. Oh great, he needs rebooting again. Well, either way, it's great to always see Derek Jacobi, and it's funny how of all the actors in this special who have returned to the proper series, he was the only one to play the same role he played in this one. That is the power of the Jacobi. On that note, and again I'm jumping the gun, one really fun fact is that this is actually the very first Doctor Who related thing David Tennant ever appeared in. He wasn't credited since it was just a bit part that he happened to get, but it is really cool that he is in this. We're locked up for the weekend! And while it didn't really do anything for him in terms of recognition, it is impressive how much this special did for the franchise behind the scenes. It's like finding out the guy who did the voice for James Bond in the audio drama would later go on to be in one of the movies. Wait, that actually happened? Well, anyway, back to the plot. The Doctor's call brings in the military who evacuate the town, and the Doctor begrudgingly decides to help them. However, en route to their evacuation, Cheney and Joe get intercepted by a Schalke, and Cheney is taken. Allison. The Doctor carries on with a group of military personnel to find the Schalke's lair, including this awesome guy called Greaves. Why continue the punishments after the town's been evacuated? I don't know. Maybe they're alien monsters who don't give a flying? Greaves. What is it? Dirty great alien monster, sir! 
Just a guess! Seriously, I could watch this guy give one-liners all day. Sadly, he and the others get separated from the Doctor, who literally jumps into the mouth of a giant alien creature so that he'll take him back to the TARDIS. Well, it wouldn't be the last time he does that. He then meets the leader of the Schalke, who reveals their plan to him. You don't need an invasion. The humans don't use the inside of their world. Rather than be their conquerors, you could be their lodgers. Much more fun. Though you'd probably have to take a turn cleaning out Wookiee Hole. I think not, Doctor. I think she might be on the right track there. The public of this country do seem to have a problem accepting asylum seekers, which is very unfortunate. Though them being part of the Wookiee Hole attraction would be cool, then it would finally be interesting. Oh yeah, I said it. The leader then reveals that they have Cheney and use her as leverage to get the Doctor to help them. So, sadly, business as usual for the companion roles in the franchise. Not that it does either of them much good anyway, since they just keep him around to get into the TARDIS to figure out how it works, and once they do, they decide to kill the Doctor by throwing him into a black hole. Yeah, right. Of course, he doesn't die and manages to summon the TARDIS via his mobile phone. Does that come on a pay-as-you-go contract? And find the Master cooperating with the Schalke. Perhaps he's just sick of being a bottom. Easy now, Huck. Let's not get too dirty. I certainly will be tonight. But, of course, it turns out to be a trick, and after the argument about whether they go back for Cheney or not, the Doctor returns to the army base, where it's revealed that they've captured a live Schalke, where it's revealed that they are vulnerable to pure oxygen, and their screaming has some sort of mental control over humans. Makes sense. In marriage, you get stuff done easier by screaming at each other. Meanwhile, Cheney has returned to the surface and finds Joe, but they both get compelled to do things that they don't want to do, like Joe knocking out the soldier escorting them and stealing a jeep, and Cheney not being able to call the doctor, and that's not the only thing wrong with her. Oh no. Congratulations, it's a head baby! Yep, they implanted her with some kind of mini Schalke, which is also mind controlling all the other evacuees, which caused them to kill caretaker tenant. Get off the fence! Get away! Stop it! Off the fence! Stop, stop me! Turns out the Schalke have been implanting these in people all over the world and been activating them to take over the planet themselves. Turns out that the sore throats that everybody has been having has been a way to surreptitiously convert the atmosphere for themselves. The scream forms the nitrogen and oxygen in the atmosphere into the more complex compounds. This is the fast track invasion plan. Get you to do it for them. Or to translate from the techno babble, they decide to move the flat upstairs, but it smells really bad, so they're fitting air filters to fix it. Only it's like if you fitted the air filters onto the cockroaches in the walls to do it for you. Hey, if I could train roaches to fix things for me, I'd do it. Like what? Your attitude for a start. So, as this is a typical Doctor Who story, it comes down to the final confrontation with the Doctor, the Big Bad, and the Companion. So, what's the plan? Open up the black hole to their lair and suck them all in? Cave in the base? and crush them all? Well, to be fair, the Doctor's had weirder plans to save the world. And this is also what happens with you on karaoke night. So, the Doctor literally sings them to death, except the leader, who was able to resist it. Though, the Doctor does take one of my suggestions and opens up the black hole and does a Ripley from the first Alien movie and kicks it into the hole. And so, with the Schalke threat over, Cheney decides to take off with the Doctor for future adventures that sadly never happened. So, that was Scream of the Schalke. And how was it? It made my ears bleed. Now you know how I feel. This special is quite good. It is rather slow paced and can drag on, sadly, but it does have great atmosphere. The voice acting's good and the writing's great. It's all the best parts of RTD's writing. Witty one-liners, good humor, relatable characters, an endearing doctor, a genuine threat, and minimal speechifying and piousness from the writer soapboxing through the main character. Okay, there is a little bit of that in this special, but it's not that bad. Really, the only major downside is the animation, which, like I said, isn't bad, but it could have been a lot better. Which, it was made a lot better in the next animated special. The Infinite Quest was written by Alan Barnes, a long-time audio drama and novel writer for the Doctor Who franchise, and was made as a special addition to the children's behind-the-scenes spin-off for the franchise, Totally Doctor Who. It was basically a way to hype up the kid audience for the week's upcoming episode and give them a little peek into how the series was made. But, for 13 weeks, they would have quick animated segments released in an old-school movie-style serial way, and each part being a continuation of the next. And, after they were all shown, they were eventually put into a full version with them all shown seamlessly as a full episode. 
This sounds like it might be disjointed and full, but actually it works really well and flows perfectly, which we'll see as we get into it. The special opens with this steampunk Darth Vader looking dude called Balthazar, the galaxy. about to destroy the Earth. Quiet, Core, this is my moment of destiny. Moment of destiny. Moment of destiny! Oh look, he's got an annoying animal psychic that won't shut up either. You ever think of putting me in a cage? And you'll be needing to regenerate. Fine by me, maybe my next form will have his hair back. Or you'll be ginger. I see no problem with that, you're ginger and you seem to be fine with that. Not wasting any time, the Doctor arrives, and since this was made during Series 3, naturally it's David Tennant's 10th Doctor and Freema Ageman's Martha, in all her drama school dropout glory. He gets his heart's desire, the destruction of you, me, and Earth. Yeah, I'm not a fan of Freema's acting, sorry to say. So the Doctor has shown up to stop Balthazar from using his force field to turn all the people on the planet into diamonds. Which sounds like a major plot point, but it's just a footnote, and one of the many crazy, silly, but cool as hell things that happens in this special, like this. By giving him this. Oh, shouldn't have done that. That spoon was at our peak. Forged by the now extinct inhabitants of a planet which specialised in Rubicola. Fungus, your deck is rusting away. Well? The Doctor does seem to have an affinity with defeating enemies with spoons. Because I am the Doctor. And this is my spoon. By the way, Balthazar is voiced by Anthony Head, who you may recognise as Giles from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and was also in the main series as the leader of the Krillitanes, Mr. Finch. It's a shame he doesn't get more work, he has an amazingly sexy and sophisticated voice. I turned it up by hand over countless decades. Burnished her into the greatest warship in history. And I would know. <laughs> As you can see, the animation this time is way better. It's still Cosgrove Hall and the four years of technology and evolution shows. It's much smoother, the art style is much more professional looking, there's bits of CGI in there that gel really well, and it still looks a bit like a motion comic and it isn't the most lively of animation, but it's still really nice to look at. Even if the more simpler line work does have Martha's tie back hairstyle make it look like she's a black statue of liberty. The shading is also much improved, it has a much better sense of depth and polish to it, so bravo Cosgrove Hall on this. A shame they didn't stick around to keep experimenting with this format. I'd love to see what they do with it. So, after they defeat Balthazar with a spoon and free his pet robot parrot Core, they decide to head off to their next destination. But, of course, Balthazar swears revenge. I'll get you for this, Doctor! I'll make you sorry you were ever born! At this point, it'd be easier to count the amount of people in the universe who haven't sworn revenge against the Doctor. Kor then hijacks the TARDIS, and this is meant to be several years after the previous encounter, and says that he has cut ties with Balthazar. Kor sold him out for a bar of gold. Or three. What do you need gold for? He eats it. But tells the Doctor that he's still out there planning something. He's after the Infinite, a cosmic fairy tale of an ancient old ship that supposedly contained the remains of a cosmic being of infinite power, and is able to grant any who finds it their heart's desire. Just one problem. No one knows where it is, and the only way to find it are to find the four pieces of the original flight recorder. Kor gives the Doctor one that Balthazar had, and the Doctor uses it to track the remaining ones to make sure Balthazar can't get his hands on them. So, it's basically the plot of Avengers Infinity War, but with British people. Okay, even more British people. The next one on the list is another pirate, and this time it's an oil pirate. Hang on, they still need oil in the future. It ran out on Earth. The corporations went drilling elsewhere. Either that or big oil just kept making things that need to use oil to keep them in the black, so to speak. You mean that as a financial term? Or by how if you work with oil you'll always be covered in black? Either and all, Huck. Either and all. This pirate is about stealing the oil from the corporations to give to the poor, Robin Hood style, and is much less of a charming corsair than Balthazar was. You dogs are either oil core spies, or planning a spot of pirating yourself. Still, good to see Lisa Tarbuck doing a good job of voicing her. Who? Lisa Tarbuck, famous British comedian, actress, and radio presenter. No, never heard of her. I'm sure she's never heard of you either. Well, I'll soon change that. So Captain Calico and her literal skeleton crew, wonder if this is where they got the idea for silence in the library, decide to make Martha and the Doctor walk the plank because she thinks they're part of Big Oil. But, turns out, she's got it backwards. I'm with Oil Core. Riggs, attack! Lucky 
Seems they went to the Stormtrooper shooting school. After Calico's ship runs aground, the Doctor and Martha try to get Calico's data chip, but she makes a break for it instead, though she doesn't get that far. No! Surely the Four couldn't do that? No. She's been murdered. Well, no time to find out who murdered her. Let's get to the next MacGuffin. The next place they arrive at is a jungle planet full of sentient bugs where they come across this dashing gentleman. Meargrass. Ulysses Meargrass. Good thing the bugs listen to you. I'm here to provide their community via their queen with protection. A giant lizard protecting insects is like a Roman Catholic porn star. That makes so little sense, though I can't deny I kind of like to see that. Or it'd be like me protecting you. Indeed. Turns out this planet is entrenched in a war between the bugs and the humans, starship trooper style. At first it seems that the bugs are the victims, but after the contractually obligated Welshman that's in every Doctor Who episode explains... Then the bugs arrived and drove the people out. I only joined up once... Once my parents were killed. We can't even roam the valleys with my dear Flossie anymore. And it seems that the Queen of the Bugs is an even more royal tosspot than Prince Andrew. Your contract stipulates final payment on delivery. I lied. There will be no payment. Murgrass abandons the Queen and she agrees to do a deal with the humans before she's nuked to oblivion. To broker a deal, David Tennant does one of the most embarrassing things he's done in his career. You got Doctor Vile! Pirate of the Constellations! We've been ruling over these insect raiders! Held their queen, he asked Hard to say what he would regret more, this or working alongside Rooster Teeth. One's just embarrassing, the other one's a massive dent to your reputation, though at least this one was short. They catch up with Murgrass, but he's had the same treatment as Calico. Either that or he saw the Doctor's terrible performance earlier and did himself in from the shame of it. But they still get his data chip and use it to get to the last planet in the stream, the prison planet Volag Nok. And given the Doctor's history, I can't imagine he'll have an easy time getting through the door. Scanning. 3,005 outstanding convictions. That many? You don't get to be as cool as the Doctor without breaking some laws along the way. Don't I know it. Fortunately, they just happened to throw him in a cell with the Governor in it. Seriously, what are the chances of that? Turns out the guy who's in charge of the prison is an inmate who hacked the guards to make them believe he's the Governor and stuck the real Governor in a cell. But the Doctor frees him and makes his way to the fake one, Gurney, who is also the guy who has the final data chip. Turns out Gurney, played by Stephen Grief, who you may recognise as Barnum from Fable 2. There are people across the seven galaxies who still want my head on a plate, putting my face on wanted posters. Good farewellizations to you. Wanted Locke, the original governor's life of luxury, so made himself the governor, but Locke's back now, but of course, Gurney makes it out with the chip. You know, they really aren't good at stopping people from running away, are they? Of course, they try to catch up with him, but... Guess what happens to him? Oh, um, he decides to open up a Palm Beach resort on the planet with free space hoppers for all people over 87? Your mind works in very weird ways. No, he's murdered too, and it's finally shown who's murdering them. Revenge! Finally! Baltazar. You're surprised? Yep, Balthazar set up this whole thing. He made Cor give Doctor the data key so that he would track down the rest of them for him, and kept following him by tracking the brooch that Cor gave Martha, which turns out to be Cor's son, Squawk, who is sadly now an orphan since in his last moments, Gurney managed to cook his goose. You will cry at the death of a CGI robot parrot. Balthazar then forces the Doctor to program the TARDIS to go where the Infinite is, and then kicks him out of the TARDIS, and they arrive at the Infinite. But then the Doctor arrives in style. And hear all about my adventures on Volag Nock? How I bottle-fed Squawk with molten gold and reprogrammed Lock to run a better prison? It's been three years, you know. I assume the Doctor programmed the TARDIS to reach the Infinite three years after he was abandoned in preparation for this plan. Otherwise, it seems that time travel isn't as exclusive anymore if a robot parrot can do it. But seems a lot of things that seem impressive aren't what they're cracked up to be anyway, as it turns out the Infinite only shows you your heart's desire, not gives it to you. Which, good thing I've never been there, just seeing an eight foot tall red haired sex gladiator with tits big enough for moons to orbit it might drive me insane just from seeing it. What's your heart's desire, Huck? To find my real dad. Yeah, good luck with that one. The Doctor uses his sonic screwdriver to make the ship break apart and rescues Martha, but doesn't leave Balthazar to perish in the big black on his own. Swap. Curse you, Doctor! 
and we'll never see him again. So what did I make of this one? This special may not be as deep, smart, or atmospheric as Schalke, but damn it all if it isn't fun. It's clearly made with a younger audience in mind, but as Sarah Jane Adventure showed, that's not a bad thing. And much like that show, this still feels like it's a work for all ages, and it's insanely creative, fun, and just a blast to watch. Scream of the Schalke has much better writing and more highbrow point of mind to it, but if you just want some fun with some good dialogue and wacky adventures, this is the one you come to. We get a lot of locations, a spaceship, a desert planet, a swamp planet, an ice planet, and then a wrecked space station. Add in a jungle planet and a sky city, and that's all the locations from the original Star Wars trilogy. And all the new characters and guest stars are great and have amazing designs, and it almost has an old school Danger Mouse or Duckula feel to it, which is fitting given it's Cosgrove Hall. And while the story narrative is a little hectic, it does give it the feel of an old Flash Gordon or Humphrey Bogart serial. It's awesome. Also, it makes great use of the music, and while it's all recycled from previous episodes, it sounds awesome. You can never beat Murray Gold. Sadly, this was the last of the Cosgrove Hall made specials, and for the last one, they decide to go in a very different direction. So, let's get into that one. Dreamland was released in a similar format to The Infinite Quest in a bunch of serialised mini-episodes. However, this time they were made available via the Red Button service on the BBC Digital Channels over the course of several weeks. Man, does anyone younger than me even remember the Red Button function? Uh, I just figured that was a slang term for a clitoris. Final warning, Huck. Unlike the previous specials, this one was done with CGI, and while that might sound cool, especially given how good the CGI was on the previous special, it sadly didn't measure up. <laughs> Ah, the smell of fast food on the desert air. The perfume of America. Oh god, and I thought the CGI in Cats was ugly. It looks like we've taken a wrong turn and ended up in some sort of Doctor Who fan mod for Borderlands. Except I think even that would look better than this. Yeah, this animation's not that good. The models look really weird and off-putting, and while it does have more motion than the previous ones, it does look very awkward and just not very appealing to look at. Which is a shame because besides the animation, this special is still pretty good and taps into something that I'm surprised Doctor Who hasn't done an episode on before, the Roswell crash. Yep, we got a full Yankee Doodle Dandy themed episode as the Doctor shows in his arrival in all his first Toy Story movie animation glory. Howdy there, partners! Howdy. How you doing? Seriously, his arms are so stringy and stiff I half expect him to reveal that he's the cheese string man in disguise. He comes across two natives, Cassie, who, fun fact, is voiced by Georgina Moffat, who has also played the Doctor's daughter in an episode of the same name, and would eventually go on to become Tennant's wife, and is also the real-life daughter of Fifth Doctor Peter Davison. Now there's a confusing and Freudian situation for you. You're one to talk. And Jimmy Stalkingwolf, the son of a local Native American chief, and finds a weird do hickey and of course it turns out to be an alien artifact and well roswell 1950s alien device naturally the men in black show up This is Mr. Dread, Subtle name. who would actually reappear in the Sarah Jane Adventures, which is a nice touch. So the Doctor, sex doll Jamie Presley, and discount renegade beat a hasty retreat and come across the villains, the Viperox, which I will say, despite the bad animation, have an amazing design. They then get taken to Area 51, and the Colonel in charge, Colonel Stark, decides to give them a mind wipe. No, not the mind pro! I had to, it was just one of those moments you needed to seize. Also, Men in Black, Giant Bug, and mind wiping? Hmm, where have I heard all of this before? Fortunately, they managed to escape. Great, but we're still trapped. Oh, I love 1958. No one's seen Die Hard or Alien. I can't deny I'm kind of loving all the pointless references in this episode. It's cheap, but it's so rare Doctor Who ever does stuff like this. They make their way through the base and find the Grey Alien who crashed in Roswell all those years ago, and it turns out she's not the only extraterrestrial in the base. This is Lord Aslock, played by the late great David Warner, our villain of the special, who is working with Stark. I warn you, Colonel. Fail me and your world will pay the price. But no time for that. The Doctor and the gang hijack a flying saucer, although it looks more like a giant flying pasty, but quickly get shot down and run into the Viperox hive, hidden underneath the ghost town of Solitude, and find themselves the unwelcome guests of another alien royal. I don't think she's amused. I have this effect on royalty. Run! Now it's turning into the plot of them. They then Minecraft their way out of the cave and run into the men in black again. Mr. Dread. 
These are my associates. No, no, let me guess. Mr. Fear, Mr. Terror, and Mr. Apprehension. A shame we couldn't meet their other friends. Mr. Paranoia, Mrs. Xenophobia, and Little Johnny Hysteria. Weren't they the Secret Service codenames for Trump, his wife, and son? Turns out these guys are the robot drones of an alien police force making sure that humans don't find out about aliens. But I can't imagine they're very good if a simple bow and arrow can take them out. <laughs> Turns out Jimmy's grandfather, Night Eagle, saved them and has another little surprise for them. Five years ago, we saw his ship crash. Others searched for him. Men in black suits. Those who knew swore to tell no one. Talk about the Native American sense of hospitality. Turns out this guy is the husband of the other great alien in Area 51 and was sent to rescue her. But the Viperox, who are their sworn enemy, have been hunting both of them and this guy got shot down while looking for his wife by these guys as it happens. No, I don't think you will, Doctor. On behalf of the United States government, thank you for leading us to this alien. Where did he come from? Through the plot convenience pothole, I guess. Turns out that the Viperox convinced the US Army, or at least just Stark, that the device from the diner, which is actually a genetic weapon to wipe out all the Viperox, could be reprogrammed to wipe out all Russians. I know the US was super paranoid of nuclear war at the time, but wow, that is a bit extreme. If anything, that'd be more likely to cause a war than anything else. Also, again, I get it, he's paranoid and on edge, but what would make you believe this guy over the kind and gentle grey aliens? This guy couldn't look any more like a bad guy unless he was voiced by the literal personification of evil from Time Bandits. Oh wait! Fortunately, the Doctor manages to grab the weapon, but rather stupidly runs onto the roof instead of out the front door, and thus gets cornered. If you trigger this weapon, you will kill millions of innocent people! You're talking like a red. And there's only one cure for a communist, and that's a bullet. All right there, Joseph McCarthy. However, unlike McCarthy, the Doctor manages to convince Stark that the Viprox are the bad guys. Unfortunately, Aslock is quick on the update and thus unleashes his army, and to make matters worse, has mortally wounded the male grey alien. However, his wife says that there's something in her ship that can heal him, though that's going to be harder than it seems. Just be careful not to uncover the Ark of the Covenant while you're in there. Eventually they do find the healing ball and manage to make their way back to Area 51 to heal the male Grey, just as the Viperox storm into the place. The Doctor convinces them to reprogram the weapon to just deter the Viperox and uses the TARDIS to chase them off once and for all. Well, I tweaked the weapon to attack the Viperox nervous system on an ultrasonic level. Yeah, nothing deadly, just really annoying. Keep the bugs out of the house by a light year, or your money back. They really make bug bombs efficient in space. So the Doctor leaves the group amicably, and the Greys are allowed to leave in peace, and so ends Dreamland. So, what did I think of it? Well, the animation is crap, I will admit that, but it's like any episode of Doctor Who. The effects may be awful, but the good acting and writing shines through it, and that's the same here. I feel this special gets a bit too much hate thrown on it, and yes, even evaluating it on its strengths, it's still not as good as the previous two, but it's still good, I feel. And that's the three specials. They are very different in their own ways, but it is cool to see this franchise experiment with different formats. But Sadly, it's not really something they ventured into again for new content. And granted, animation is expensive, even cheap looking ones, so I can see why they decided to avoid going back to this, especially when the audio dramas do very well and cost a fraction of the amount to make them these specials did. But that doesn't mean Doctor Who has never ventured into animation again. Eventually, lost episodes of the classic series got animated recreations, including some by Cosgrove Hall again. And while the animation in them is very varied, it's cool to see these lost pieces of media brought back in a new way. I do wish the franchise would return to this media again. Sure, what we did get wasn't perfect, but they were entertaining, and it was great to see the show in animation, and with Disney now helping out the franchise, it seems a good opportunity to try it again. Though hopefully they won't make it like this. The horror. But you never know what the future might hold, isn't that right, Huck? Huck? I'm telling you, this could be big money, Zigzag. Get Sheila to be Amy Pond. She's already got red hair. You could call it Dr. Screw and the Cyber Muffs. It'd be killer. What do you mean I'm a liability? Yes, I know I turned you down for being a mascot, but I'd love to direct. Finally get a chance to be in control. 
Uh, fine, I promise I won't attack any of your staff with a cricket bat. Again. Uh, he hello? Best of luck with that one, Huck. Though I'd be down to watch it. But for now, I've had enough of this. I'm going on the other side to have a bath. Bye.